All right, so this is our last set of notes for units one and two. This is statistics or how psychologists ask and answer questions. This is gonna look like a really big chunk on your notes packet. It's um, like two pages, um, front and back. It looks like a lot, but much of it is diagramming and things along those lines. But it's still very important that you keep in mind for yourselves that you, you want to be adding down as much as you can as we go through this. Statistics is one of the areas where kids get confused the most when it comes to everything that I'm going to go through unless they're in AP stats. Otherwise, this stuff is going to seem fairly foreign to very many of you. So I want to make sure we are able to ensure that you get as much explanation as you can. And we'll definitely do some activities in class to make this stuff a little more easy to be understood. So first thing we've got to ask ourselves where statistical reasoning is concerned. Why carry out stat procedures? Why attempt to you know, compose any level of statistics on the data that we get? And the basic answer behind that is it enables us to see what an unaided eye isn't able to get. So we can take a look at a much larger picture. You could see something like this and be able to make generalizations or summarizations or analyses of data that you might not necessarily be able to do in other manners. So stats give us a kind of uniform means of carrying out procedures to analyze and interpret data that we collect. Statistics give us a, statistics give us a meaningful description of data we consider to be important to our research. A very important thing to keep in mind is that if we take a look at statistics and they're misrepresented in any manner, that leads to falsehoods with regard to, you can see right down here, you have two graphs. You can see over here to the left, we have a breakdown of percentage of certain brands of trucks still functioning after 10 years, and then our brands of trucks down here looks very, very different to represent them in this manner over to the left because they all look fairly similar as opposed to narrowing in and focusing in on just the percentage from 95% up to 100. It looks very, very different in its representation on the left as opposed to the right. So it's very important that we don't come to misrepresent data because it can very much lead to incorrect conclusions. Okay, few vocab terms to keep in mind. Mean, median, mode, three very important measurements of central ten tendency. Your mean is going to be your average of scores that are within a distribution you've gotten. And the way that you go about collecting and est establishing your mean is by adding up all the scores that you've gotten and then dividing them by the number that you have. So let's say I have five students that are gonna go about taking an AP exam. I add up the scores that they got, I divide it by five, and that is going to be their mean or their average score on the test. Your median is the middle score in a rank order. Okay, so this means let's say I take those five and I have one student gets a 65, one gets a 68, one gets a 75, one gets a 78, and one gets an 82. Okay, my median is going to be 75 because that's the middle score in my rank. And then your mode is the most frequently occurring score in the distribution. So let's say out of those five numbers, for example, I have a student that gets a 65, a student with a 78, a student with a 76, a student with a 75, and another student with a 75. My mode then in that scenario is the number that occurs most frequently, so it would be 75 out of those options. It's also important to keep in mind when you're looking at your measures of central tendency, what measures of variation are involved. You have two basic terms to know about with regard to measure of variation. You have the range, okay, so that's the difference between your highest and lowest scores in a distribution. And then you have standard deviation. This is the average difference between each score that is processed and your mean, which is your average number. So it's going to be the in the middle of your distribution because it is the average of all of your numbers. And then the standard deviation is going to be the amount of difference between the scores that are provided along a bell curve like this. The larger your standard deviation means the more spread out your scores are from that mean, from the average, okay? And the smaller your standard deviation, which is this red one right here, 
That means the scores are more bunched together, so that means that they are shorter distances away from one another. Okay? So how do you go about calculating a standard deviation? Multiple different ways to do this. First one is the arithmetic way of going about doing it. You have this basic structure here in terms of an equation to establish standard deviation. So in order to do standard deviation this way, it's slightly more complicated, we have to do this. The square root of the sum of x minus the mean, x being your scores, that should all be squared, and then that should be divided by n, which is your number of scores, minus 1. Now, as if we haven't confused you enough on all of this, what you should do in order to get to your scores right here, you have to put your scores in descending order. And we're going to do some examples of this, so that way you guys get a better feel for it while we're in class. So that way, in case you're confused, it's easier for you to follow. So let's talk standard deviation more in depth. Ladies and gentlemen, this bell curve is going to come back to you over and over again, especially when we move into scenarios of development and taking a look at standard deviations of development of looking at IQ and intelligence scores when we move into those different units later on. So standard deviation will come back to you in later units, so it's very important that you pay attention to it. A normal standard deviation distribution is a bell-shaped symmetrical curve, meaning that you have 50% of your scores going this way, 50% of your scores going this way. The span of one standard deviation on either side of your mean line, which is right here, is going to approximately cover 68.2% of your scores within that bell, cor within that bell curve. Okay, so if your average IQ is 100, and that is your mean right here, that line, most IQ scores then will fall within one standard deviation of this bell curve average of 100. 34.1% will go to the left of the bell curve, or excuse me, of the mean, and 34.1% will go to the right. The IQ extremes are outlined here towards the end, and these are going to have very, very low percentages of people falling within those parameters, okay? So, if we take a look at this, one standard deviation is going to be here in this deeper blue. So, in normal IQ curves, this is a good way to help test yourself on another means of establishing a standard deviation. Two standard deviations will expand your level of people falling under the bell curve, meaning that you're going to go out an additional 13.6% on each side. So all told, 95% of people will fall within two standard deviations of your mean. Even further into the outlying areas, we get an additional 4.2% added on. So where three standard deviations are from the mean, you'll have around approximately 98% of your people falling under the bell curve. And then you have the final outlying uh, portions of this within a fourth standard deviation. That means that 99.994%, so virtually everyone, will fall within that bell curve. Again, to remind ourselves, you're going to have 50% of people in a normally structured bell curve, not a skewed one. We'll move into what those involve in a second. You're going to have 50% of people fall to the right, 50% fall to the left. What do you do if you have a skewed distribution of things, not one that is evenly distributed? I want you to take a look at this breakdown. It is a distribution of families and income per family in thousands of dollars. So this is a very skewed distribution of things because your breakdown goes like this. Okay, here's your mean, but 68.2% of people are not falling within that one standard deviation of your mean. You're getting an outlier here. My question to you to think about is, why is this distribution skewed? Why isn't it perceived to be a normal bell curve? What is going on here that could be a confounding aspect to explain our skewed distribution? And further, how would you change this graph? How would it change for us if we were to remove the 475 here, the
the 710 here and the 90 here. How would the measurement of this distribution change in terms of its figure? So how can you tell then if a distribution is negative or positive in terms of its skewed representation? If you find yourself with on a graph a plotting similar to this here to the left, the majority of your, sc your scores are falling above your mean because here's your mean right here, this is your average, so your distribution is skewing this way. This means one or a few of your scores are extremely low, so that's causing them to be less than your median score. In the opposite way of things, if the majority of your scores fall below the mean, only, and you have only one or few high scores, that means that you're going to have that as greater than the mean, so it will be positive. Okay? Really what you're looking for when you see a skewed distribution like these is, are there a few scores that seem to fall either too low or too high uh, outside of your median score? And one of the last things we're going to discuss is inferential statistics. To infer means that we can take certain findings and draw certain conclusions regarding those findings. So with inferential statistics, in order for us to enable our findings in an experiment to be generalizable out to an entire population, we need to make sure that the experiment is tested and tested and tested over and over and over again. Okay? The best way to bring us down to this point and to ensure that our findings are not due to some weird fluke that has occurred and you know that we haven't taken into account, we want our findings to be what we refer to as statistically significant, meaning that the differences between two observable sets of data that we've collected are probably not due to chance. They're not due to some fluke or some mishap that in fact that difference is due to possible differences in the populations that you studied for whatever reason. Okay? When we say that data is statistically significant, we represent that number as P, okay? so we had R with correlational coefficients. For statistically significant data, it's P. You want your P to be less than 5 hundredths meaning that the likelihood of a difference in your findings being due to chance is less than five times out of a hundred times of it being tested. Okay, So that is a very, very, very small window of possibility that your findings were due to chance or some you know, fluke that wasn't factored into things rather than just this was tested over and over and over and over again and we can account for a small difference in our population to explain why there are two separate groups of data that don't equate to one another. Okay? It's very important to have statistical significance because that means that your results were tested properly and that you took into account multiple different issues and that you were able to account for those issues so that way confounding variables that we've discussed are, are addressed and could not possibly contribute to why you have the findings that you do. So it's very important to keep inferential statistics in mind. I know that much of what I just covered with you guys was probably very confusing. I know that it's not terribly easy to be able to break these things down when I'm just speaking to you. So we're going to go into quite a few different kinds of examples of breaking down inferential statistics and going through various different means and standard deviations to ensure that you've got a really good solid foundation on how to do stats.